thank you for being here today to the to Abby, to Jose, to Shannon. Let's start from left to right on my screen at least with Abby. Abby, what is your job title? Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity. So my name's Abby Getman Skillicorn. I am the special projects manager for Massachusetts Farm to School. We're a statewide nonprofit agency that works on getting more local foods into school cafeterias, as well as more learning opportunities for students in their school gardens or taking foreign field trips and getting to know more about um, our food system economy. And uh, you're one of the panelists at an event that's called Voices in Food Equity that's coming up real soon at June 12th, tomorrow. Um, and I'm just going to read what the promo says. Join us as we delve into the pressing issue of food insecurity from childhood through college years across Western Massachusetts. Our diverse panel will lead discussions on hunger's far-reaching effects, innovative community-driven solutions, and the vital need for legislative action. And I wanna delve into that with the three of you. I just wanted to give more of a context to why we're here. Jose, could you please introduce yourself and what your job title is? Yes, uh, good afternoon, Jose Lopez Figueroa. I'm the director of the Center for Access Services at Springfield Technical Community College. Uh, the Center for Access Services is essentially a social work agency on campus. We provide extensive non-academic support to students, helping them overcome barriers and personal life challenges that may impact their ability to stay in school. One of the more robust and, and uh, great services that we offer is a food pantry on campus and combating food insecurity. Um, in addition to the food pantry, also basic household necessities, uh, toiletries and, and personal uh, hygiene products as well. So um, very similar to a small mini mart uh, convenience store, totally free for students on campus. Um, ultimately, our goal is that, or rather our mission is that of the college uh, to support students as they transform their lives. Where, eh, Jose, can the students go to pick up the supplies? Which building? Yeah, so we're located in building seven on campus. We also have uh, grocery food grade uh, outdoor lockers and, and building 13 on the north side of building 13, which those can be accessed Monday uh, through Sunday at the student's convenience um, through a simple cell phone QR code or, you know, a uh, special code via their email. So, so students can shop online. We have an online shopping platform 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, and then they can pick up in our office during our normal business hours, or they can request for their groceries uh, to be placed. In, and these are refrigerated, temperature controlled. So even frozen items uh, will maintain frozen. Um, students can pick up Saturday morning, Saturday evening, Sunday morning, um, after work, seven o'clock at night um, at their convenience. Okay, thank you, Jose. Uh, Shannon, please, such a, such a pleasure to see you again. A please your job title and why you are participating in this panel. Yeah, it's wonderful to see you too. And I'm just impressed by the work that uh, these colleagues on the call are doing. So I am um, president and CEO of Martin Luther King Family Services and where, you know, um, mission is really to strive to foster an environment where we nurture and empower the aspirations of individuals and families and our youth, you know, to really achieve their dreams and new realities of, you know, peace and social and economic justice um, towards self-determination and self you know, sufficiency and self-actualization. And so I think, you know, for me, um, our food pantry, which is one of the many programs at Martin Luther King Family Services is, the fourth largest in the area. Um, and it's really important for me that we, how we provide those resources um, of food supplements to our community really matters. Um, we have to be on the journey with them. And what I'm most proud of is, you know, that we in this, we're designated, located, you know, in Mason Square, designated as a food desert, designated as low income, low access footprint. 
and we're welcoming constantly many new neighbors to the United States and, you know, which has barriers being multilingual, right? And so we want to make sure that we are indeed welcoming and that we are indeed serving as a community hub that not only provides the food, um, but also provides a bridge or access to other resources like medical care or mental health resources, SNAP benefits, WIC, you know, all those things that make um, for a rich, self-fulfilling, you know, life. Um, and so that's really our mission and couldn't imagine not being a part of this conversation, especially with other um, folks that are as, you know, innovative and as committed to ensuring that there is equity and access um, for these life's basic needs, right? <laughs> like everybody deserves um, to have and needs to have their bellies full because, you know, that's the way in which they're going to begin to really leave a full life. So excited to be um, gaining new colleagues and new perspective um, on, on things. So that's why I'm saying yes to this. Oh, thank you, Shannon. Este, Abby, there's a, the hunger that is in, in, in across the country, but we're talking about Western Mass for now. Uh, why is it called food insecurity versus hunger? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think that, you know, similar to how, you know, you could call it a food desert or food apartheid, right? In certain communities, um, food insecurity is really, it's a, you know, a policy uh, driven, you know, language response to a, a policy created issue. We have enough food in this country. We have enough food in Western Massachusetts you know, to, to nourish everyone to be thriving, but we do not necessarily have, uh, the outlets or the, um, access points that are really critical for people to be able to, you know, take, eat, consume, cook, grow, you know, the kinds of foods that they want to be eating that they know is best for their bodies. Um, Shannon, you know, when people go to the MLK, uh, you're on a bus route, uh, which is really good. But still, it's just, huh, we've had this experience here. People are hungry. You know, we, part of what we do at Holyoke Media is when we have classes, sometimes we're able to get some food and it's just like, wow, it's just gone in an instant. Um, what is your experience with the, the youth and the, and the adults who participate and MLK programs. Yeah, I love that you're lifting that up because folks that are working, right? So I love like the stigma around who are the participants. Um, yeah, folks are working, folks are going to school. We have college students that um that come, you know, and 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 are trying to access the resources that we that we have. Um, oftentimes, because they wanna make sure that they are indeed, like you said, Abby, putting the right food into their bodies. And so looking for ways to um, supplement. Um, and so it really is important, like I said, um, in talking that how we approach this really matters um, because Everyone deserves. Everyone, everyone deserves to, you know, to have a dignified experience. Everyone deserves to, to have um, what they need when they need it, and that's really what I think we're we're all about. You, you know, not having any stigma or, or um, around our services, and and so for me, just being that space. Where, where everyone feels welcomed, whether you're a volunteer or you're a participant and not really seeing sort of the, the demarcation line because we're all in this community together. There's a, there's a fallacy that people who are poor are to blame. They are not to blame. And it is for no shame. And it's also how to address that. Don't Please don't be ashamed that you need food. It's, it's, it's almost like, please don't be ashamed that you need to breathe air. If the circumstances in life, policies, they all come together and and herd people into places that they don't want to be in. If they, Jose, 
you're representing a, 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 a school of, of higher learning, a college, uh, a Springfield Technical Community College. These, these pantries that you have, these products that you offer to the student body and staff, is that, or is it students? Yes, uh, we're open to all. Um, we are a member agency with the Food Bank of Western Mass. Um, and so uh, our goal is to serve the hungry, serve those uh, who need. So, so is staff, there, yeah. Is there, is there a measuring way of knowing, thankfully we have this because then that's keeping the staff working and it's keeping the students in class. Is there like a sort of a correlation between you having food to give to give out yeah. and people then staying because this is a place where they can get good nutritious food to take back home. Yeah, certainly. Our, our biggest our biggest clientele, I guess, so you will, lack of better words, is students, right? So um, um, right now we're, we're not seeing much of any staff um, um, involvement or, or staff of uh utilizing the pantry a lot of that also has to do is is we did a complete overhaul um of of our pantry what it used to be um to what it is today and we're only i guess a semester old we we launched our brand new what we now call the ram mini mart um to shannon's point earlier about dignifying the experience and combating stigma uh we decided to go from what used to be called the ram cupboard to the RAM Mini Mart, um, a, a name change. We, we want students to know that it is a Mini Mart. It's a convenience store on campus, but it's free, um, which is why we have the client choice, student choice shopping model online um, to combat that. But we just launched all of that uh, through a, a grant that we got uh, in the state in January. Um, so it was a complete overhaul, uh, diversifying our products, increasing our inventory. Uh, we're, we're using a, a food pantry software management uh, software uh, with, with an online shopping platform. So we haven't seen much um, um, staff, uh, faculty and staff traffic. And I just think that's, it's new, right? Um, and I also, you know, with respect to all of our, my, my coworkers, yeah, I think a lot of us see that our students need it. You know, we, we are a community college. So I, one thing I know factually is all of our students are either living somewhere where somebody's paying their rent, they're paying their rent, they might be in a shelter. Um, they all have bills and lives to pay. Um, you know, they all have to go get a meal. We don't have a traditional dining commons. So um, the, the need is great, especially with a community college student that leads a working, uh, you know, so-called normal life working, but then also has to carve out time for school. Um, so we've that's, that's where we've seen the biggest usage. Um, we've actually seen from last semester to this semester, a 230% increase in household members served in our students. Um, and, and just that, we've been able to increase to ensure that we're serving not only the student, but the household. Um, you know, I'm a father. As parents, we know that if my kids aren't eating, I'm not eating. And so we have a lot of parents that go to school here. Some of our students have children in Springfield Public School System. Um, and so we serve the family. Um, we've seen an increase even in some of our students who have um, seniors or elderly parents that they are uh, um, responsible for or assist with. So we, we now uh, are able to serve the household and we've seen um, again, a 230% uh, increase in the amount of, of people that we're serving, and it's predominantly uh, students. Um, Shannon, before este, you leave, um, your, your organization's in a food desert. River Valley Market was one of the uh, supermarkets uh, that many years ago, maybe 10 years ago, made a presentation to the Mason, ha Mason Square Health Task Force. So did Big Y, so did Stop and Shop, so did this other one. What I, if there was a supermarket in Mason Square across the street from Stick, which was basically what was being offered and nobody wanted, not the River Valley Market, which is local uh, and the others are you know, from other places, wanted to take Springfield up on that. How does that food desert situation affect the people who live and work and who have children who live there 
and they have no place to get, you know, okay, let me get, just get you some food and, you know, get you a sandwich so that you could take to MLK a, after you do your homework or whenever. Oh, well, it's deep, right? I mean, that like, we know biologically, like, what food does, what nutritious, healthy food does for our bodies, for our brains. Um, and so for me, I love that you are highlighting this because it is necessary. And one of the visions that I have um, for MLK is that we will, you know, down the road, it's going to take some planning, but we've discovered that there is um, a supermarket approach to a pantry. So I'm, I might be coming to you, Jose, to talk about like, what does it look like to shift you know, into a mini mart. Um, and so for me, it's like, if the community, if if these retailers aren't going to take on and invest in our community, then then we will, right? Then we will be the change that our community needs. Um, and again, being mindful of like how that experience is for our community. And so um, that, that's, that's part of what's in my heart for ensuring that, you know, folks in our community have access uh, to to the resources that they need. Thank you very much, Jan, and thank you for having joined us today. Yes, thank you, you so much. Leave, so. I'm excited to be with you all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got to thank soon. you. If I could just um, say, Shannon, uh, feel free to reach out. I'd love to collaborate and, and chat. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Yeah. All and right, then, ciao for now. Tomorrow. Thanks, Shannon. And then Abby, um, you're representing the the River Rally Food Food Co-op, and we I don't know if you were here back then about ten years ago or so when River Rally. Yeah, was I wasn't on. I certainly wasn't on the board. I don't know if I was even a co-op owner member then. Okay. I know that there's continues to be a lot of conversation about. Certainly, there's been. The expansion to build the second store in East Hampton, which helped, you know, really alleviate a lot of the pressure that we experienced in the Northampton store. And that project was, you know, it, it, you know, it was a $20 million project, including raising over $5 million from owners to, to pay for it. And I think that there continues to be questions that we receive, um, both, you know, for folks like, oh, we want to co-op, you know, in our community from folks who are self-organizing and want to establish their own co-op, as well as folks who um, have been asking, would River Valley consider an expansion project um, in different communities? And so they're, you know, it's it's exciting opportunities. I think a lot of it also does boil down to policy making and, and kind of the, the financial viability and incentives that can be provided to grocery stores to go into different communities um, that, are, you know, necessary, uh, especially like, you know, River Valley Co-op doesn't have a, a corporate structure that's backing it up. We have, we're owned by 16,000 people who, you know, each have an equal share of, of the business um, with a $200 um, owner member, you know, equity that we pay either upfront or you can, you can extend it out and pay on a monthly, on a monthly basis. Or we'd also have subsidized shares for, for ownership as well. Yeah, if they, and the reason I bring this up, just as Shannon has said, the impact of having a food desert in a community, yeah. Yeah. and because nobody else is here from retail, you're the only one. So I'm, that's why I'm hyper-focused on River Valley Market, that it seems that it's a community. It has, I think, good values, and yet it could not find a way to eliminate that food desert. And that was maybe the best hope that Mason Square had. And, you know, I guess that if, to say, I mean, people who are poor and struggling, then asking them to organize a food co-op. I mean, people who are well off, you know, still yeah. needed leadership and meetings to be called by other people and to create River Valley in the first place. Um, so it seems that part of the responsibility does lie squarely with our local retail supermarkets in for whatever reasons that they thought, and this is before you, decided, no, we're not gonna go to Mason Square, but we'll go to East Hampton, which is also another white community, but we're not gonna go to a community where there are people of color. And that that has a direct impact right here. 
and, and then we're talking about Springfield. And that is something that cannot be forgotten by River Valley. That's why I'm repeating it because yeah, no, thank you. it's really yeah. important for people. It's like taking action. It's not enough to speak up. You got to take action. And I'm yeah. not talking to you. I'm talking to River Valley. Um, I'm talking to Rachel, the head of it. And then back to Jose, because I'm done with my like uh, part. <laughs> well, I'll also Jose. say, like, I used to work in Springfield for a number of years. I was in the food service team, you know, working, you know, like, so I was, you know, I would, I would well, be know. at Rebecca Johnson and then I'd go, yeah. to meetings, and it would be like, oh, it, you know, is GTC open today? It would be really nice to grab. Oh, wait, you know, yeah, yes. I know exactly. I know exactly what you mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate you, you mentioning that because I think people then who are going to watch this, also would have similar questions and also then need to know, even if they don't, look, there are people who work right here and who want to resolve this heinous problem of hunger. And if they, whether it's creating mini marts as Jose and his team do at uh, Stick or, or you, Abby, or, or Shannon, it needs to be done. Um, finally, Jose, and I'll go back to you, Abby, um, Jose, what's the message that you want people who participate participate in this panel discussion, the audience, what do you want their takeaway to be? The severe impact that food is created, and let's call it what it is, hunger, right? The severe impact that hunger has on our economy and the uh, our workforce and, and um, jobs, right? So in order to have a successful thriving economy, thriving community, society, we need a talented and successful workforce. In order to get that, we need some sort of education. And I'm not saying that everybody has to go to college, right? Because college isn't necessarily for all, but education is for all. And education comes in many different forms. Um, and STIC is a college, but we are, more importantly, we are an institution of higher learning, of education. We don't just offer college degrees. We offer licensures and certifications um, and, and different uh, courses um, that won't ne doesn't necessarily lead to a college degree, but may lead to a licensure or certification or a skill through workforce development, become an EMT, learn how to brew beer. Uh, there are so many different courses that we have on our credit and academic side of the house and non-credit academic side of the house. Um, so we are truly an institution of education and providing that. Um, and, and you can't get an education on an empty stomach. Um, you just can't get an education on an empty stomach. And so when we want um, a brighter future, a stronger economy, a stronger workforce, uh, you know, job training and, and, and job, job availability, we need to have an educated and trained and skilled workforce. And you, and you just can't get that on an empty stomach. Um, that's, that's why it's important to combat hunger and make sure that uh, food is, is a right. And, um, and it's easily accessed to all. Um, it, it directly impacts um, our economy and the success of, of Springfield and the Western Mass and, and Massachusetts as a whole. Yeah. Thank you, Jose. Este, Abby, what, the same question is for you. What do you want the impact of your statement to have? What's the takeaway for the participants? Yeah, I would say, you know, we're in an exciting time in school nutrition right now. You know, we passed universal free school meals uh, after we saw how necessary they really are, you know, during the COVID pandemic and eliminating stigma, right? Like any student in Massachusetts can be eating free. It really like sets a level, you know, a level playing field for, for everyone. And interestingly enough, now that uh, there has been more participation in school meal programs because they're free, school districts are able to actually afford more local op options, more local, you know, they're, they're able to both, you know, increase it, it like have increased, um, they have bigger orders because they're serving more kids. Right. And so, you know, sometimes they might have a volume, like a cost differential and they're, they're able to more affordably buy local foods because they're, they're buying larger volume and they're certainly responding more to student and, and family and staff requests for more, you know, more options that look like they're going to help get a kid through a day where they're feeling really well nourished. Um, you know, 
I, I like to say like, you know, pizza is a reverent, has a reverent place on the school food menu in, in K through 12 and Massachusetts Farm to School, we're working on helping make it a local healthy pizza. You know, Springfield Public Schools really helped pioneer working with One Mighty Mill, which is an organic stone ground flour company out of Lynn, that now they're serving all 100% organic local pizza crusts where they're making their own scratch made sauce in their culinary nutrition center that is also using a blended mozzarella product. Some of that, um, some of the mozzarella is coming from Narragansett Creamery in, uh, in Narragansett, in addition to some of the, um, some of the USDA, you know, um, cheese that they're also able to procure. And like, you know, you're hearing from students who like, the, the pizza isn't bothering their stomach as much, you know, and, and when we're making healthier options for, for our students, they're certainly able to, um, enjoy them much more so than, um, you know, than oh, here's a sun butter and jelly, which is a viable option for some kids when they're really not feeling up for, for, for other menu options on the day, but we really want a wide variety of diverse menu options that students like see, you know, arroz con pollo on the menu because it's food that they want to be eating. It's not necessarily going to have the same amount of salt um, that they might have at oh, home never mind. because of the nutritional um, restrictions. There are, you know, sodium and sugar restrictions on school meals that can sometimes cut into the flavor, flavor profile. The yumminess, the yumminess factor. But no, this is really interesting. And I appreciate you saying that. I, I appreciate the three of you. Este, Shannon Rudder from MLK Community Center and you, Jose, and you, Abby, um, for, the, for talking about the complexities about hunger and how to resolve it. And one of the ways that you just mentioned, um, Abby, of, well, let's make it nutritious also. Let's not be feeding the students in the schools. Yeah, like you said, pizza and something. I don't know. It's called beef barley soup. I don't know what it is. It's like cut up shoelaces and sneakers, you know, with respect to whoever has the contract with whoever. But just, yes, have more farm to table. And yeah. we are surrounded by farms. Yeah. So that we, I mean, I, I guess it's a way of coordinating all these farms to produce enough to distribute so I that people are about, not left short. Yeah, I was at a wonderful event last week in Holyoke at Donahue Elementary School where the Holyoke food truck was serving, you know, it was a community event um, in conjunction with their food court members, you know, their planting activities and, you know, pin the sticker, the, the tomato on the plant kind of thing. <laughs> for kiddos. And they served well over 350 uh, ta tacos with local local tortillas from Mi Tierra. Um, as well. And they had both vegan options. So there was a, a black bean and and butternut squash option or a, a chicken option. And it, I would say like school nutrition is working to be more responsive to what students want to be eating. Wow. Thank you. I, I'm hungry. If they're <laughs> talking about all this food. Thank you so much, Abby, for all you do and for your presentation tomorrow. And thank you, Jose. And of course, a shout out to Shannon. This is happening tomorrow at Stick. Jose, can you tell us exactly what time and which building? Yeah, it's happening tomorrow at Stick, uh, um, excuse me, at, at Springfield College, not not Stick. It's happening at oh. Springfield College, yeah. Um, and it's from five to 7.30. It will mm -hmm. be in the, Richard B. Flynn Campus Center, which okay. is um, in room 41, which is the back room, uh, but it is on Springfield College campus. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's going to be in Springfield College at the Flynn... Uh, Richard B. Flynn Campus Center. At the Campus Center, and there'll be signs when people get there. Yeah. Or they can ask people, where is this taking place? Um, again, thank you. Thank you all for the work that you do. Um, and I hope it's a, a successful event in the sense of people are more aware of what hunger is. And it's not enough to say, ah, oh, I just get a hamburger from one of the fast food joints and you're all set. And just to also keep the brain uh, getting some good nutrition as well when you eat good food. Thank you to you both. Thank you.
Thank you.